Arsenal uh, win back possession and it's broken nicely to Gazzola. 30 metres from goal, plays it to the edge of the area. Alexis Sanchez goes for goal and scores. That's a brilliant goal from Alexis Sanchez. He's been Arsenal's star man this season and maybe now they're going to get the point. I'm still forever blowing bubbles. <laughs> Good morning, Mike. How are you? Good morning. I see your creativity is uh, is on point right now. It and, is. Uh, we have the same song as last week. It is. This whole me and you being in two-hour time zone away kills me in the early AMs. But, uh, <laughs> you know, Mike, we've scored 12 goals in one week, so I think we can continue blowing these bubbles until that, that little drought happens. I'm with you on that. I am so stoked for this podcast. <laughs> I get it. Yeah, because we played Stoke. I did there? Yeah, see, I did that. I, yeah. I wrote that. I wrote that myself. You re- you didn't Charlie Adam this podcast yet? <laughs> Not yet. That didn't really work. <laughs> Good week. It was a great week, and let's get into that. But before we do, let's go to our weekly question. Mike, you wrote this question again, so I apologize <laughs> to all the listeners in advance. If you could sit beside neck beside if you could sit next to one current Premier League manager and listen in whilst he is asleep, <laughs> who would you most likely select? Now there's some controversy this week, Mike. Yes, there's because a Mike and I don't typically share each other's answers <laughs> and He's a little upset with me, so I'm going to go ahead and give my answer. Yeah, slide that in there so it looks like I'm copying you. Um, while Klopp seems to be the type of guy who sleep fights, and I'd <laughs> love to see that, um, for me, I think I'd listen to Slavon Bilic uh, for a couple of different reasons. But the biggest one is I bet he has what appears to be like a red phone in his office, you know, like the old bat phone, and that connects to Canio. And when DiCanio calls him two to three times a day and feeds him advice, that <laughs> advice just it results in nightmares. <laughs> nice. So are you watching him sleep in his office or is the phone in the office and then you're going to his house and so watching So the phone's him sleep? in his office. He takes DiCanio's calls during the day. He goes home, hits the bottle hard, goes yeah. to bed, and that's when the nightmares occur. Okay, so you're in his, you're in his bedroom then basically, mm-hmm. which, is, which was the intent of the question. I mean – Obviously, you oh, fucking... and he is fully aroused while he's asleep. <laughs> there, there's a nocturnal <laughs> emission we could, because it isn't an Arsenal podcast unless we talk about the Genitals. male, repro- yes, yeah, the male reproductive system. <laughs> mm-hmm. So yeah, of course you fucking stole my answer, um, son of a bitch. Um, but yeah, looking at him just standing there last weekend, catatonic, mumbling to himself is kind of what gave me the idea for the question in the first place. So. I'm going with uh, with Slavin Bilic. Uh, I, I could see him tossing and turning in, in his bed, flashing back to the war in Yugoslavia, just talking about mob hits and and, and kicking his feet out, going, "I will never tell you." <laughs> and uh, in Croatian, so I you know I, I didn't study up on how you say that in Croatian or if Croatian is even a, partic- a language. Well, but, it, uh, it is, and we cover that on our Croatian podcast. <laughs> Yeah. So we'll cover it there. Yugoslavia and you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> then I would watch as he just stops talking and just starts kind of his fingers start moving towards his mouth and he starts breathing in and out deeply like he's smoking 25 cigarettes because obviously he can't go eight hours without smoking a cigarette. And uh, so, yeah, Slavin Bilic, but since I can't copy your answer, uh, I, my my distant second place would be Claudio Ranieri because it would just be eight hours of beautiful opera, and that's even more so after yesterday. Now, do you think he dreams in beautiful opera, or do you think Claudio hires a full contingent of artists to play him opera whilst he falls asleep, is asleep, and while he's waking up? The answer to that question is yes. (laughs) He was so pumped yesterday. He was so pumped yesterday. Yeah, I would be too. I would be too. I think he celebrated more yesterday than he did the entire season last year. (laughs) Considering that they either beat or tied, I don't remember exactly, but they beat or tied Man City twice last year. Uh, Yeah. Yeah, good for that. 
Yeah. So let's move on to the Basel game. Um, you know, going into this match, I think every Arsenal fan just assumed, hey, second place is, is on, the, uh, on the books. I did. I have to admit. I think we all did. And then Ludogorets, those <laughs> sons of bitches. <laughs> those rascals. Yeah. Those, those the SOBs. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, just 11 beautiful men on that field for Ludogorets. 10 beautiful men in Kefu. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Cavani, just briefly, he scored against us twice, correct? Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, he did. So he had, he had a great impact on both of the matches against us. But holy shit, did he miss enough chances to, like, beat well, he, Dor- missed- he missed enough chances to break Dortmund's record of the most goals scored at a group stage. He missed 15 chances in the first game we played against them alone. I mean, he scored one, but, like, you know, even a fucking broken clock is right twice a day, like you've pointed out. So, I mean, it's mm-hmm. – yeah, he uh, – I'm not sure he's the answer for our striker needs. Let's put it that way. Yeah. Even though he does have 20 goals in 20 games, I think I read this morning. Yeah, but, but it's I mean, French League though, right? I mean, look yeah. at Slatin right now. I mean, he's not he's not firing on the cylinders he did when he was playing in La Liga. Oh, no, wait. <laughs> Syria, Syria, that's the one. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, he's played, like a, he's played in all of them. Yeah, he 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 has. League My oh. son Jake was he was listing all the leagues that he played and all the teams he played for, and I was like, "Are you done yet?" And he's like, "No, there's a couple more." <laughs> so yeah, what do you what did you think about the the lineup? I mean, I I, I was very uh, pronounced in tweeting and thinking that this would just be treated like a dead rubber. I I I was wrong, but I I'm always wrong. <laughs> Yeah. But I just thought and, I thought he would treat this kind of as a uh, you know let's let's take Stoke more seriously than Basel. In hindsight, the strong lineup was a smart move because ultimately we needed those three points, and I felt like it was a lose lose for Arson because if he had set out with a weaker starting eleven and we drew or lost that game, and the oh result God. happened in Paris the way it did, people would have been pissed. Absolutely. We go out with a strong lineup and someone gets hurt, and then everyone's like, well, this didn't matter. People are going to be pissed. We went out there with, I think, a, a, a strong lineup. We we put a good starting 11 that would have challenged Basel because they're a good side, and ultimately we got the three points we needed. And I think with the strength and depth that we have right now, we can afford to go ahead and put those types of players on the pitch. I was, however, a little bit frustrated that some of the substitutions didn't happen in the game a little bit sooner than yeah. than later. I mean, you're you're up three nil, four nil. I mean, that you know, come on, man, a little yeah. bit earlier. But uh, but I mean, it it has. I, I cannot remember a time when it has been harder to second guess Arsene Wenger. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, second guessing Arsene Wenger is and is kind of like a, a separate sport that a lot of us love to do or or regret having to do and it's just been so easy in recent years to do that not this year i mean his <laughs> he treated this game like an important one uh with the lineup he put out there he risked some of our players the risk paid off we dominated the game and it wasn't even the players that you know that that i was thinking that we should sit that necessarily carried all the weight but it just it, he's making all the right moves i got to i got to admit and i love the man you yeah know, yeah. It's impossible to second guess him right now. The entire starting eleven from we'll just say one to eleven, everyone played exceptionally well. I mean, Basel are a good side. There's no doubt about that. And we did very well to take a four nil lead away from home. And it's it, you know, you can only beat the teams they put in front of you, they say, but that's a good team and so it was a great result for us. And you're right, those players that came on for to, to change or rotate into that starting 11, that's what we are looking for, right? We're looking for players to come on and make a difference when they get that opportunity, and, and it's, it's great to see that we have that. Yeah, and, and Basel's, you know, Basel's not the Basel of a couple years ago, let's be clear, but they're still, I mean, they are a good side. And Ludogorets, we've, obviously they are a good side. We just made them, you know, I mean, they, they look good for, you know, for 45 minutes against, or 40 minutes against us in one game, but 
you know, we pretty much spanked them nine nil for the rest of the, uh, the rest of the time we played them, but they're obviously a good team as well. We're just making them look bad. No, no, absolutely. And, and I think they're the team in our group that gets to go to the Europa League. So let's hope that they go and do the scum. Yeah, absolutely. They do this, they do the scum. They do, uh, uh, they do United. Uh, they're, they're going to be our – they're our team now in the Europa League. They're our favorite Europa League they team. They are. They are. So let's go to the goals. Uh, Lucas, I, I <laughs> mean, geez, what a, what a season he's having. I mean, limited season because of injury, but when he's coming on, he's making it count. And yep. would you say he was lucky for those two – the first two goals, Mike, or was he perfectly placed? Uh, yes. Again, my answer is yes. I mean, he, he's a, he's a l- little bit lucky, Lucas, in the sense that <clears throat> his goals seem to just find his, his feet. Uh, and I think that's, you know, that was the case in the, um, a little bit in, in the other game where he scored. I mean, there's like two games where he's just scored tons of goals. The, the, the Nottingham Forest game, I think was the other one, but, mm-hmm. um, but you know, <laughs> You you make your own luck, and and if you're you're in the right place at the right time, uh, the first goal probably you know the 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 crossing. I mean, it was a beautiful move, but that cross to him should probably not have squeezed through. The defender really just overran it, and uh, and Lucas you know f- finds the ball on his feet, 18 inches from the goal, and and frankly you know he had a a coffee and a cigarette while he waited for everyone <laughs> to fall down and then kick it in. But, uh, you know, but that it, it was effective. And the second one, I think was just a rebound off of a pretty strong shot from the other side. And, and it came right to him, but you know, people have a knack for being in the right place at the right time. So you make your own luck and, and, um, you know, I'd rather have someone who's standing there than, than have a beautiful play that ends up with a, you know, with a ball that rebounds into empty space because everyone's, you know, playing beautifully and just not in the right place. So, I mean, Lucas may be the, uh, the rebound guy and I, and I'm fine with that. Yeah. And that's, I mean, it's a poacher, hundred percent. He's a poacher and we've been wanting one of those since the days of Francis Jeffers. And so to be <laughs> able to say that we've got Sanchez, Giroud and Lucas all on form and all healthy is just outstanding. And I'm super pumped to go into this Christmas break with some depth and some strength and see, uh, see our team bode well. Yeah, and that second goal, I, w- I had the you know I had the, the game on the television and then the PSG game on uh, on the uh, computer or iPad or something like that, and and our second goal went in pretty much at the within about 15 seconds of when Ludogratz took the lead against PSG, and it was like at, at that moment it was the, it dawned on me that this was all kind of starting to feel a little Olympiacos y. I mean. Yeah. For, yeah, last last year was a little different because I mean we we had complete control over it, but it was a miracle we needed in order to even stay in the competition. This year it was about finishing first, and it wasn't all in our own hands. But you know that 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 match day six magic all of a sudden started to kick in, and and um, you know especially when when Olympiacos battered back PSG's attempts to take the lead, it was just it was amazing. And the fourth goal that we scored, Awobi's goal, I I wrote a whole like magnum opus opera whatever uh, about that goal because and 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 i lost it i can't find it anywhere so i'm just going to go from memory because that goal is one that just i mean it it, it was a work of art that mm-hmm. goal and, and um from start to finish i mean the the it, it actually started with with uh gabriel holding off uh the uh the basel attacker for like 10 yards I mean, sometimes you know they 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 shield the ball off and it goes over the end line and it's like two three feet that they that they do that. This was like ten twelve feet. I didn't think he was going to be able to 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 keep the defender off him, but so he does that, earns a goal kick. Uh, Ospina, David Ospina, no mm-hmm. less. We had a great um, game again. He did, David, absolute David, hundred percent David. David Ospina kicks it out to Koscielny on the side of the box. Koscielny pings it up to a Wobi who's checking back nicely and, and presents himself for, for, for Koscielny. And a Wobi ends up knocking it back to Koscielny who just pings the ball forward on like one touch pings the ball forward, I believe to, uh, Ramsey who is in stride heading forward. Ramsey 
runs up the left and kind of leaves the ball for Alexis. But meanwhile, Awobi and, and, and Ozil are just running full speed off the ball, nowhere near the ball, running full speed towards the box, cross in front of each other. Alexis just, you know, just pings the ball up to Ozil with one of those Dennis Burkamp passes that makes the defense look like they might have a chance at it. And, uh, and Awobi recognizes this. Ozil takes the two defenders with him and Ozil just puts the ball back in the perfect 45 degree angle for Awobi. And, um, yeah, it would have been better if I had what I wrote in the first place than that. But just watching those two guys off the ball run full speed like they knew what was about to happen was, was amazing. I mean, if you have a chance to go back and watch that, just all the way from a goal kick to a goal that was perfect. Well, a couple of our goals started in the our own 18. I think Lucas picked the ball up in the 18-yard box, and then there was a series of 15-plus passes to which he then pinged the ball into the back of the net. Again, very Dennis Burkamp, where you're picking it up, starting in your own box, and then and then putting the ball into the back of the net. I, you know, to be fair, Basel's consolation goal was really well taken, too. I, I think that Kashani could have been a little bit at fault, but at the end of the day, no keeper saving that. I mean, it was just a, a well-taken goal, and you got to give them a lot of credit, and it's too bad that uh, that um, they're not going to be continuing on in a European competition. But uh, you know, yeah. I'm sure they'll be back in the Champions League next year. I'm more than happy to give them credit when when they score a consolation goal when we're up four nil. I'll give them all the credit in the world for that. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, at four nil, you can easily quit, and that guy just, you know, I mean. At the end of the day, you're always trying to get on someone's radar. But I do hope Lucas gets a run in the team. I hope they, I hope he stays healthy with a lot of other players. But it's great to, like I said, it's great to have him, Giroud, and, and uh, Alexis fully fit, scoring goals. And we've got Welbeck that should be coming back here in, what, three to four weeks? Yeah, I mean, our, th- yeah, three to four weeks. It's the famous three to four weeks. <clears throat> it's an incredible issue to have. I mean, in our front line, we got a Wobi, Theo, Ox, Lucas, Giroud, Welbeck, Draxler. I mean, all these guys <laughs> that we have are uh, are all kind of fighting Draxler for two or spots. Draxler Vlad, Dragomir? Uh, I'll take either one. They're both $30 million players. <laughs> uh, and they're all fighting for two spots plus kind of the, you know, the, the Alexis, uh, you know, rotation spot. And, you know, none of them necessarily, other than Draxler, are world class, but, I mean, it, it allows for so much speed and versatility and different strategies that, that we haven't seen in recent years. So, I mean, I, we're, we're, we're rich with wingers right now, that's for sure. Spe- talking about being rich with wingers, um, I'm watching the United Tottenham match right now, 84th minute, and it looks yeah. like Mkhitaryan just got t- taken off on a stretcher. And from, wow. from the uh, – from the little of this match that I've been watching, he seems to be the only shining light for United. So, let's and what does that say? So, so did so did Jose? Uh, did he work magic on making Mkhitaryan good, or is he just an idiot for for punishing him for three months for apparently no good reason? Well, I thought he was hurt when he joined the club, and I also think how, how dare I don't he? think yeah, I don't think Jose actually wanted to sign him. I think it was the agent of Pogba. Pogba! Oh, yeah. <laughs> Mino Raiola? So, the most powerful man in football. So back to, back to yeah. Arsenal. Uh, this is the first group win we've had in five years, Mike. And it's the first unbeaten group run we've gone on in 11 years. Since so, 2006? Yes. So what that yeah, 2006 was a good year. Although we didn't win it, it was a good year. I, I do feel like with the round of 16 opponents that we can draw, we are most likely going to face Bayern or Real Madrid. Well, the, the, the statistics bear that out. And, you know, lest you think that we just have a one in six chance of each team, it's actually not the case because of all the, the complicated formulas and formulae and, um, you know, the, the, the requirements that teams can't play anyone in their own group or their own country because it's all heavily. Heavily, you know, Spanish, German, and, and English this year, with a couple of uh, Portuguese teams mixed in. But, but yeah, our, our our highest likely opponent is Madrid, 
at 21.7%. Uh, and, and frankly, they're the only team in this competition that we can face in the next round anyway, uh, that I fear. Um, and, and frankly, I, I, I think it might be a really good two-legged series, uh, very comp- competitive. I don't think it's a, it's a done deal if we play them that we're going to lose, but, um, but they're certainly the best. Sevilla at 20%. Bayern's actually at 17%. Leverkusen at 15%, Porto and Benfica both 13%. So, uh, I mean, who do you want and who do you think we're going to play? I think we're going to play Bayern because it just seems to be the way our drawers go. Now, Bayern at the moment is a team that are low on confidence and aren't playing well. But at They the did end, win 5-0 yesterday. Well, <laughs> but at the end of the day, they're – at Bayern or Real, we can beat both of those teams. It's just can Wenger get the mental aspect of our squad together to beat those teams? Right. Um, but obviously looking at the opponents most likely, I'd love to have Porto or Leverkusen. Yeah. I'd like to – Leverkusen would be a good matchup I think. It would be a lot closer than people probably think. I mean we learned from, from licking our lips and uh, at, at the Monaco thing a couple of years ago. No team is to be taken lightly, but no. uh, I, I think we're going to end up with, with Madrid, uh, just because I like to say Madrid, uh, and I spit all over my computer when I say it. Um, but, uh, you know, bring them on. Bring them on, man. You win the, you win the group. You, you haven't lost a, a real game in four months. Uh, bring them on. Uh, I'm ready. doesn't matter. We're going to take them. Absolutely. And it's just nice to know that we have taken first and that – you know, uh, I think the biggest part of that taking first is the second leg being at yeah. at the Emirates. I mean, that 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 right there is huge. And Theo yesterday in his post match after the Stoke game was commenting that this might be the best atmosphere at the Emirates he's ever experienced, which is saying a lot. So, yeah, uh, Mr. Positive Theo. Um, <laughs> but let's move on to that that stoked match, Mike. He didn't, he didn't just turn and walk away from the, from the uh, press conference. And he did not. He did tell not. you that he didn't have time for it. No. Motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So stoke. Yeah. What do you, th- uh, I saw the starting lineup and it was the first time in a while I've actually predicted the exact starting lineup and, and in a good way. I mean, I, the, the bench that we had yesterday, is one of the strongest benches I've ever seen for either for an Arsenal team or any Premier League team. I mean, there's nobody in that bench that couldn't have just as equally started the game. No, I think that the starting eleven was a hundred percent the right call. The team did very well last week, and certain players got their needed rest during the week, and then you know they got to come out and 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 impress again. And I tell you what, Mike, there's just you look at Iwobi, who played really well against Basel and then comes on as a substitute, and we'll talk about that a little bit later, I'm sure, but it just seems right now that things are clicking, and whatever 11 comes out, there's, you know, if he dropped Sanchez for one game and put Giroud in, I wouldn't go, what the fuck is he doing? I'd think, right. all right, you know, needed rest, and we've got, we've got a team right now that are just firing. Again, the, the the urge is not to second guess right now. Right. I mean, for, for some people it is, but but for me, I'm I'm inclined. You know, I've I've been wrong so much, and and you know have have been beaten into submission with regards to trying to think I I know what the lineup should be. Uh, you know, I'm I'm perfectly happy with it, and and yeah, I'm concerned about Alexis breaking down. So if he was just suddenly not there for a game. Uh, I would buy into it. I'd be fine with it, like you said. The lineup is so strong that you – did Jose just get kicked to the seats again? <laughs> Mourinho's sitting in the seats now I, again. I, I think he just got kicked off of the touchline yet again. God damn, he's in shambles. <laughs> and they're winning this game. <laughs> I don't know. I just I just looked over and Mourinho just took a seat behind the brick wall. So I think. I think that's where they sit all the time. But the rhetoric of Jose Mourinho is getting old. It's not cute anymore. Rhetoric. <laughs> the rhetoric? The rhetoric, the, whatever. The, there you go. Yeah, um, Yeah. well, okay. So, again, we're getting distracted. we we got to stop doing these when when there are matches on that, that involve Mourinho. But, um, but yeah, I mean, I think we were talking about our, our lineup depth. And the fact that you have a, a, a hat-trick, duck-breaking Premier League goal scorer that can't even get into the game on the weekend because you have such a strong lineup that 
you know, and, and the dynamic is such that Lucas couldn't even get in the game. I mean, that's just that, – that's an incredible problem to have. It, it totally but, is. It totally is. And um, I think that at this point, you know, we got to ride this wave because we've got a huge match coming up um, at, at the weekend. And I hope he does a little bit of rotation for Everton on Tuesday and then we go into this match against City with confidence um, – because right now they're low on it and we're high on it. And I think that, again, mentally, Wenger needs to work on that, that part of his strength. But He's not used to dealing with, with so many options, I think. He's not. It's almost, like, it's almost like some of his decisions have been made for him and that he was more comfortable with that over the last few years. And, and now he's got, a, you know, he's got a, a luxury of depth. But uh, I listened to this one on the radio, and, and it's going to be like that for the next few months, unfortunately, because uh, – because my my superstar son uh, Jake made the uh, the Virginia State Olympic development team, and they practice about two hours from home, and so we got to drive four hours for two hours of practice every Saturday. So anytime we play on Saturday morning, it's going to pretty much rule me out. But uh, listening on the radio sucks, by the way. It, Do you listen to the Arsenal player, or are you listening to the BBC or Talk Sport? No. Or? I, I listen to – I think it's a talk sport. It's on Sirius uh, Satellite Radio, um, and it's, it's the talk sport people. And But just not being able to see it, it sucks. You, you end up judging the game by, like, all of a sudden it occurs to you that you haven't heard a player's name in a while. Like, <laughs> because they have to, you know, basically just bark out a name every time a pass goes to them. And in the first half, the first 30, 40 minutes – that player that I just was like, I, I'm not even sure if this guy's in the game because I haven't heard his name. It was Chambo. But that changed, though, <laughs> after after the first 30 Well, minutes. you know, it's funny because I watched it at the pub <laughs> with the Denver Gooners, um, and we were sitting and watching the match. And, and I think Joey, podcast favorite Joey, made the, made the comment that uh, Chambo had gone missing. And I felt like he was pulling that role where he was dropping back quite often to help. Uh, yeah. bleed out some of their attacks. And so that was part of the reason why he wasn't going forward. And you're right, he did get into the game in a big way. But before we hit that, Jacques' challenge. For you, Mike, is it a penalty? Is it not a penalty? Well, you know, obviously <clears throat> uh, I didn't see it when it happened, but I went back and watched it later. And, and yeah, I think it's a penalty. Um, I think it was sloppy. Um, I, I don't think that his intent was to – deck the guy with his elbow uh but i mean he'd already won the ball and to just have your arms flailing like that in a position where you know where you're gonna hit a, a four foot seven guy in the head i mean it's just gonna happen uh is uh, he he could have done better to avoid that now you on the other hand i got a text from you while i was driving and listening saying what was it that w- the cheating cunt <laughs> I think you I might think have added put, a you might have added a nationalism uh, I nationalistic did, and, and element to it. And apparently, we have a famous Welsh <laughs> listener that I upset every time. So, I, so <laughs> he's going to kick your ass. He is, and he's coming on the podcast soon too, which is going to be great. But no, for me, when you watch it in real time, it's not a penalty because it's it, it appears that Jaka is trying to turn Adams with his body. I feel like. Where I'm kind of struggling with is it a penalty, isn't it, is if that play occurred outside of the 18-yard box, like midfield, I'm sure the ref would have called obstruction. So when you look oh, at absolutely. it from that perspective, you're putting it, it's a penalty. But then I also look at it from the perspective of if you gave that same foul in front of 10 referees, I don't think eight of them would have seen that as a a penalty call. What made it worse was when you slow mowed it and you saw the elbow to the face. Did Charlie Adam embellish that a little bit? A hundred percent. What really upset me was the amount of time that he laid on the ground trying to feign this injury. And it just frustrated me because there was no blood. He clearly didn't get hurt. And they were then spraying some shit on his face. Concussions are a bloodless injury, my friend. You 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 can't just go by blood. But uh, but yeah, they. I mean, they were doing that whole like Aaron Ramsey thing, where like the players are all like motioning towards us. I mean, I, it was bizarre because I mean, yeah, he took a knock in the head, and that's that's to be taken seriously. Uh, but like 
the way that his teammates were acting, like gesturing to the sidelines, it was like he, you know, like he was swallowing his tongue or something like that. But you know, it just didn't uh, didn't quite seem that serious. But you know, I'm like, you won the penalty. You don't have to lay there for another ten minutes. But. Absolutely right. I can't wait till the days return where the football players are actually men and a <laughs> challenge. You know, they want to prove that they're a badass, so they jump back to their feet after they get absolute. They, you know, it's just right now there's just all a bunch of fucking pussies. Um, but yeah, I remember, I remember that, that 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 famous YouTube video where the where the guy's thigh gets basically chopped in half, like like it gets cleated in the thigh, and his his skin and and muscle are just hanging off the side of him, and he and he jumps up and like charges down and squares up against the guy that tackled him. It's amazing. It is amazing. You know what else is amazing, Mike, is that Manchester United have just recorded their first win since November 7th when they beat Swansea. Wow. And uh, and they're playing another team with a stupid blue and white little cock emblem, whatever that thing is that yeah. they just showed on the screen. But yeah. all right. Anytime the, the scum lose, it, it's okay with me. Hector. <laughs> Hector Bellerin returns uh, in he this does. game. You know, I, I loved seeing him on the bench. I didn't expect to see it. You know, uh, uh, Wenger's making some subs in the first half now. I don't know what's going on with him the last few games. Uh, I guess injuries. But, uh, but yeah, Hector Bellerin returns, and, oh, my God, what an impact he had on the game. He did. And, th- you know, it's funny because he, come on, he came on, and I was kind of bummed he came on because, obviously, you don't want to see Mustafi go down and, and then yeah. force that, that substitute. But the first couple times he received the ball, he was kind of shit. And we were kind of joking at the pub that Jenkinson would have never made some <laughs> of those crosses. <laughs> but yes, you, see, could, you, see could, them. you could definitely tell that he was rusty. Um, but you're right. I mean, he worked off that rust pretty quickly though. Yeah, I mean, he that, did. He did. I mean, he, the, the first goal, beautiful pass, like a, just an incisive pass from, from Alexis to Bellerin wide on the right. Uh, and, and your joke about Jenkinson is, is, is funny, but like, there's no way Jenkinson or Debushi or Maitland Niles or Gabriel would be in the position that Bellerin was able to get into to receive that pass. Mm-hmm. I mean, he's so far ahead of any other right back in the league. It's not even funny. And and he's ours for the next six and a half years. Yeah. So fuck, so fuck you, Pep. Uh, and then again, Theo just fills in that space in the middle right when he needs to, and and uh, just a beautiful one-time finish. No, it was absolutely great, and I love Theo making these forward runs. And it's, you said you love Theo? I said I love him making these forward runs. Oh. Oh, okay. But it's a well-taken finish. I mean, that that's a really tough ball at the pace it was coming into to get your boot on it and then direct it towards goal. And it's just one of those really great runs, timed it really, really well. And you absolutely give the keeper no opportunity to save it. And so uh, I think that, that that goal really helped create some momentum going into halftime. So it was absolutely, it was absolutely great. And, and again, just like in the, um, in the Basel game and seemingly more, more often, we're, we're getting a goal in the first five minutes of the second half that just changes the game. Um, and the second goal, just, I mean, just beautiful to see. Chambo... Sanchez is the ball perfectly to Ozo. I mean, just that 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 no backswing, just kind of mm-hmm. chip of the ball into the perfect perfect spot, and uh, and Ozo just you know with a much more composed and professional looking version of of Robin Van Kunt's World Cup goal from a few years ago. Any any time that little like lunge forward, head the ball over the keeper thing happens, uh, I think of that goal, but. Uh, but Ozil just looked a lot more distinguished doing it. And and again, he's running into the space. In the kind of almost in the that number nine space that Alexis is intentionally vacating, although I think he, if I think he actually slips uh, and 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 isn't in that space, but I mean uh, it's a great thing seeing uh, Alexis just kind of withdraw from that position and Ozil running right into it, and and that's something that we don't often see when Giroud's in the game. No, you don't. You and and, and there is the tactical awareness of Wenger to. The, the Stoke are such a defensively minded team, even though they've changed managers. To have a striker like Sanchez who roams is a nightmare because the center back pairing for like let's say Giroud is in the game. One of them will say, "Okay, I'm going to mark him," and then the other person's going to mark space or follow the ball. When you have Sanchez making these darting runs, combined with Theo and Ozil, 
if the center back pairing do not communicate, you lose where that player is, and you're also they're both focusing on the ball. And I think that's what happened in this Ozil case. He just made that perfect run, perfect chip, and left everyone for dead. So when, when I'm, ash- I'm ashamed that I look back at our uh, at my notes from our very first podcast, which was after the Liverpool game. Uh, it was either after Liverpool or after Leicester. I am ashamed that I, you know, you asked me the question, is Alexis ready to start up up top? And I said, maybe if it was a 4-4-2 with Giroud, but absolutely not as a starting number. I mean, I could not have been more wrong about that, and I completely see the light now that, I mean, he's given he's given teams matchup nightmares. We used to be so easy to game plan against, which was maddening, and now – People don't know what to do. They, they, they know who they're going to face, but they don't know how to play us. No, they don't. And, and with Sanchez going through all this contract talk, I wonder if part of him thinks I'm now a central forward, you know, because he's always been kind of known as that left winger who can merge and play up front. But what other team can he go to that is our caliber – or similar, because say City, he's not going to start over Aguero up front. He's not going to be able to go to Madrid and start as a central forward. He's not going to go to Juventus to start as a central forward. So it's like, where would he go to start as a central forward? I think that Venka has done a really good job at finding this position and building this team kind of around his skill set. you know. And by putting pacey wingers on the left and right and Sanchez drops deep, you're allowing two guys to bomb forward. And then you never know what fucking Ozil's doing. The guy is like the laziest football player that always pops up in the most magical positions. I don't know. Watching, watching, isolating on, on Ozil for that, that goal that I, that I just spent 45 minutes talking about earlier. He didn't look lazy on that play at all. I'm not it, saying it, lazy no, no, in the I, sense of he's, of he's langu- he's languid because uh, no, I I understand completely what you're saying. I'm just saying it, it, it's amazing that he gets that he he actually gets people who do think that uh, about him because of the style that he plays in. But I mean, if you're in the right position, you don't have to run as fast to get in the right position. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. I mean, he is he's in, unbelievable at finding space, but he's also un- unbelievable at knowing. There's no chance of me getting that ball. I'm not going to waste my energy. But <laughs> he's efficient. He's but efficient. moving on, Chambo again had such a great game. He's so deadly going forward. He had some really great passes. I mean, obviously the pass for the goal was sublime. But we've got a player that we talked about last week who is just bang on form, and he is a confidence player. And I, I truly do hope that he continues because it, his type of position and his type of role is what's going to help Arsenal secure a premiership title because him, Awobi, Theo, you could even throw Lucas in there. Those are the type of players that when you ask them to come on, you're asking for them to make an impact, and he's doing that. Yeah, and Chambo just seems to, to play so much better when he's starting the game than when he comes on as a late sub, and that's that's not always the case with everybody. I, you know, I, but, I mean, the Chambo Awobi thing, I, I love the two-headed left left wing monster right now. I mean, um, Chambo was, was confident. You can see he's riding a wave of confidence right now. Um, I love watching Awobi. I mean, Awobi, I, I went on record after the Tottenham game. In fact, I, <laughs> I went on a video after the Tottenham game claiming that the reason, you know, that, that Awobi was a large part of the reason we, we didn't, you know, take that game. And, um, and and that I think he needed some time on the bench. He kind of needed a reset, kind of like pushing mm-hmm. the reset button on him. And um, you know, I envisioned a little bit longer of a of, of a bench run for him, and and not, maybe not coming into a couple of games. But again, Arson, maybe he knows best, <laughs> as some people say. Wait, you're saying that Arson knows more about football than you do. I uh, nineteen pods in, we have to finally come to the realization. I think that, <laughs> that he might. But you know, whatever it is that Awobi, you know, after that PSG and after that uh, the Tottenham nightmare that he had, um, he seems to have gotten it back. Uh, and and now he's scored two in two games. And and uh, I mean, he when Alexis was fouled and stamped on, which we'll get to, uh, Awobi didn't give up on that play just because Alexis was in front of him running with the ball. Mm-hmm. And if he had given up on that play, it would have been an easy, you know. Easily defended situation, but he didn't. He came in and he finished 
nice and composed, and, and that's got to do wonders for his confidence. Yeah, I, I was really surprised, Mike, that he didn't pass that ball because I feel like whenever Awobi gets into the 18-yard box, he's he's passing rather than shooting. But you know, you can tell he he's probably a little bit perplexed that he's not starting because of the form that he has shown in recent weeks. But that's what we want. We want a young player who takes advantage of the small amount of playing time he gets. We want a young player that scratches Arson's head or makes Arson scratch his head to say, "Hey, who should I be starting?" Um, but we also want a team where they're close knit and you can tell that a Wobie and the Ox are friends. And I just hope it long continues that the two of them continue in this form. Charlie Adam is a cunt, Mike. Oh my God. He is terrible. I mean, I don't know what you expect from someone who looks from someone who is 31, but looks like they're 55. Like, <laughs> what a piece of shit. And, you know, I, and I, and again, I didn't watch the games. I just watched the highlights. So, I mean, was Shawcross not playing yesterday? Uh, I, I don't think yeah, he did play. Because I mean, you know, I saw him in person uh, against West Ham a few a few weeks ago, and just brought all those memories back. But I mean, Charlie Adam, he is more consistently an asshole than either uh, Shawcross or those horrible Stoke away fans. But I mean, Charlie Adams just he's just a douche. We when I got home, we slowed it down frame by frame to see whether it was intentional or not. And he, he goes out of his way with his leg and his eyes to spot Alexis on the ground and stamp on the back of his calf. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's no question in my mind that that was intentional, especially when you slow it down. And, I mean, who even thinks to do that? <laughs> All right, so my granite Jaka kit, which I – opened up like it was Christmas and Hanukkah all wrapped into one uh, back in August, is now ha- that kit has a record of 16 wins, four ties, and zero losses in all competitions this season. So, um, you know, I, I, I think we should start taking collections to reimburse for that kit. But, yeah, I didn't have it until the Watford game. I couldn't wear it for the Middlesbrough or Southampton uh, EFL Cup games. So, I mean, there's something about that kit. And since my superstition is to only wash the jersey after a loss, uh, yes, it's starting to smell a lot like Granite Xhaka probably does. Uh, but long may that last. So, I just assume based off Granite Xhaka's looks that he smells like roses. <laughs> he smells like – like uh, what is that, that, that soap? The Irish Spring or, or yeah. something like that? Yeah. yeah. I mean, well – but I'm sure after a game, it's, he smells like roses and sweat. And well, uh, I don't think so, Mike. I don't yeah, think well, so. Well, well, I'll find out because in March when I go back, I'm going to smell them. And, uh, and I'm hoping that by the time I come back there in late March, uh, I, I get stopped in the airport because my, my suitcase smells like absolute body odor and garbage and roses uh, to find out what the odor is because that will mean that we have still not lost. It will. It will. And so may that continue – I think the only negative to take out of this week, Mike, is that Mustafi uh, went down injured with a hamstring. Uh, after yeah. the match, Arson said that it would he'd be out for four weeks, which with Arsenal is probably more six to seven. Eight. So, yeah. <laughs> eight. Be- Any hams- hamstring, hamstrings are usually eight weeks. But Bellerin's return means that Gabriel can shift to center back. Gab's been playing uh, very well in the past few weeks, so let's hope – that we stay healthy during this crazy run, but Mustafi, you think that's what they're going to do? I mean, Mustafi's going to be out for the whole Christmas period. So I, 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 who else could play center back? I mean, that's You're, uh, Rob Holding. Well, maybe you can throw Rob Holding in there, but I think for matches against City. Uh, you, you know, you're, yeah. you want Gabrielle, maybe holding plays against uh, Everton. I don't know. I don't know. Who knows? Well, and, and again, how how lucky are we that just as Mustafi's coming out, Bellerin's coming in. Right. And, and I mean, and, and we've got two people, neither of which are per Murtisacker, that mm-hmm. we're comfortable slotting in there. I mean, yeah. it's, <laughs> again, this is, this is not the way it usually is. I think r- right now, if you're Arson, based on – Gabriel's form and the way that he's played in, in the last, what, three matches he started, um, you're, you're putting him on the team sheet next to Kashani. Um, and, and unless he has a huge fuck up, I don't really see Rob Holding getting in unless it's just to rotate for, uh, for keeping a player, um, 
giving him some rest. So let's go to non-league or non-Arsenal in the <laughs> league, Mark. Is this, where, is this where we talk about Luton and Stevenage? <laughs> yeah. Not non-league section of the show. Um, yeah, Pep, the Pepster, Pepperoni. I mean, you fucking dick. <laughs> <laughs> Enjoy, we need to enjoy this. I mean, I, we could be eating those words next week, but, uh, yeah, I mean, this was the perfect time for Vardy to have a party yesterday. I, I again, I'm listening to, to it in the car. Um, I didn't get the full magnitude and I actually haven't seen any of the goals, but I mean, what a game and I, what a shit show that they're becoming all of a sudden. Yeah, I had the match on yesterday and, you know, for me, it was kind of twofold. It was nice to see Leicester City come back into the form that they had all last season. But what really highlighted for me was this tactical genius that Pep is called and everyone thinks he's amazing. And I'm not saying he's not, Mike. But let's be honest. You oh, yeah. and I could have won the same amount of shit that he won at Barcelona. Yeah. All you had to do was keep those players healthy and you just had to have – a little bit of knowledge with football. Bayern, again, you could go into that league with that team and run the table. And I think that Bayern, the expectation for them was a Champions League under Pep, which he never got. But it's a different game coming to England because you play Arsenal, Tiki Taka. You play West Brom, who are going to defend you, and they're going to throw players at you as quickly as possible, and they're going to just want to nut you from left to right. You play Liverpool, where it's high pressure, high tempo. It's not the same. You don't have every team playing the same style. So Pep, I don't understand why tactically he didn't go into this match and say, okay, we know they can hit us on the counter. We're kind of shit defending on the counter. So... Yeah, let's play possession football and not give them the opportunity, but a lot of teams tried that against Leicester last season, and it didn't work. So what the fuck was he doing? I mean, that was an absolute shit show. Absolute shit show. Yeah, I mean, it. it, it I've never been more confident about being able to go up there and get three points. And, and I mean, we've, we've actually played City very well the last couple of years, both not only in the August friendlies, but in the, in the, in the actual season itself. But... Uh, uh, but yeah, I mean, the, I, I love the failure of others that I hate. I, I just—it's it, so enjoyable, and this season has been wonderful Schadenfreude when it, Schadenfreude when it comes to that. Well, every it's per- a long way from being from being complete, though. I mean, there's, no, there, it, there are only four points I think behind us in the table, but we can making that seven next week would be glorious. Oh, absolutely, absolutely, and and you can you can totally tell that City losing their spine yesterday. So Aguero, Fernandinho, and company is brutal. Uh, or excuse me, Adam Mendy, because I know company hasn't really been playing, but it, it's brutal. And I guess you could say that Bravo is is kind of lost as well in there. I mean, he. Some of those, some of those goals, you know, uh, I think Joe Hart would have probably kept out. But um, yeah. let's hope that the. I, I don't know. I know that Otamendi had a one match suspension, I believe, and so. Uh, uh, God, they're better off without him in there. But I mean, who who, who steps in? I mean, they they don't have uh, Mangala anymore. <laughs> what a waste of money he was. Yeah, I don't and, know. And uh, you know, I mean, they they just it's it's comical how little attention and quality they have put on their back four. Absolutely. Hey, Mike, um, did you see what happened with Cardiff yesterday and Sol Bamba? No, I know nothing about this. So this is absolutely amazing. So Sol Bamba. Is this Car- our, non-league, our non-league discussion? Yeah, so, so Cardiff and Ipswich played yesterday, and Bamba was dismissed for uh, an angry reaction to a tackle uh, by Jonathan Douglas and confronted the referee. He then went on to confront and verbally uh, and, and physically fight the fourth official. He then <laughs> decided that he was going to fight the Cardiff physio. He then <laughs> decided that he was going to fight Neil Warnock, his manager. So essentially, he just goes from fighting the player, the manager, the fourth official, the physio, the Cardiff City boss. <laughs> it was fucking excellent. Did he then like? Did he go up to the owners' box to take on the? He didn't. <laughs> I don't think he went up to the owners' box, but uh, but Neil Warnock after the kit guy, he, the he was just absolutely. I've not seen this part of him before. He was absolutely furious. <laughs> <laughs> 
Oh, that's fantastic. And we'll save that for, uh, we'll save the rest of that for the, uh, the non-league player furious podcast that we do. Yeah. It was just, it was so great. And I really hope that, um, heads, heads gone. Heads gone. <laughs> As, heads uh, gone. <laughs> so quickly looking at the league table after this morning's Chelsea win, they're still three points ahead of us and one goal ahead of us on goal difference. Uh, Liverpool are about to kick off. Actually, they just did. Uh, they're four points behind us, City of four points. The Scum are now eight, and uh, United are in sixth position, ten points behind us. So what are you uh, laughing about? Uh, I, just think, I just think it's hilarious. <laughs> so we are going into the Christmas period in a good run of form. We're starting to get a little bit of a cushion between us and some of the other teams, and, and I hope that – we can continue that run. Um, and Chelsea, Chelsea's going to be the you know the stickler. I mean, they 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 don't look all that susceptible to to one of these patches that the other teams are going through right no. now. So and then when you look at our so we have Everton who terrible uh, bit of luck and and run a form. Uh, then we have City, and then after that it's a it's a it's another streak. It's where another one. It's West Brom, Palace, Bournemouth, and then we've got Preston. In the FA Cup, but then we have Swansea, Burnley, <laughs> Watford, and then we face Chelsea on February 4th. So between now and February 4th, which is a long time and a lot of games, those are all games outside of the City game. Those are all matches we should be running. It does start to make our November look a little bit more acceptable, doesn't it? <laughs> a lot more acceptable. Four minutes in and Liverpool are already winning. Oh. See, I didn't get there yet, but we're blowing bubbles right now, Mike. <laughs> That's true, we are, and and we have uh, we have three listener questions this week, two of which you probably haven't even seen yet because they came in very late last night. Um, but uh, are we gonna we want to go to listener questions now? Of course. Okay, um, Dougie Cazorla, last week's uh, book winner. Uh, there is no book up for sale, to, uh, up for grabs this week, but. Uh, Dougie from Syracuse. Uh, oh, asked, Dougie Cazorla. <laughs> Dougie Cazorla. I wonder if his uh, his family calls him Cazorla or Cazorla. But um, if you could be wingman to one Arsenal player for a night, not Jack, he, he, he'd taken Jack out of the running, who would it be, where would you go, and what's your drink of choice? What do you think? Well, that's a good question. Um, Are you, you going to steal my answer for this one? Again? The obvious answer may be... The obvious answer would be Giroud because he just slays <laughs> pussy. You son so, of a- <laughs> if you're single and you're ready to mingle, Giroud is that guy. Uh, so it sounds like I did steal your answer. Uh. Uh, I also think that, and and I, you know, we talk about it all the time, but the Ox just seems like a really funny dude. So I feel like if you went out for a night with him, you'd just have a great time. Uh, he is, constant man. I mean, banter. I, I- I know you got a picture with him, but I can tell you from our time together that we hung out and 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 chilled uh, back in Cali. He, he, you're you're absolutely right. He's a very cool guy. You know, I'll I'll tell him next time I hang out with him that. Hey, Mike. Uh, you know, I didn't just get a picture with him. We had a nice five ten minute conversation. It was probably actually more like three minutes. But <laughs> it se- it seemed like a lifetime. It seemed mind. like a lifetime, and I was a bumbling idiot. But dude was just really really chill, and uh, I'll have to put a picture up on our podcast page of my office that I just finished, but. Chambo was nice enough to sign a shirt for me, um, and then I just got that framed, and I hung it up, and I'm pretty proud of it. Nice. Well, it should be. But but th- my answer is definitely Giroud because he just – you know he he's the type of guy, Mike, who just goes out there and just bangs bitches. <laughs> <laughs> and we're, you're so politically correct. <laughs> uh, all right, so Let's what be is honest. Your- there's no women that listen to this podcast. <laughs> Where would you go, and what's your drink of choice? By the way, women, we love you. Uh, where would yeah, I where- go? You know what? I'd go wherever the party takes us, but our drink of choice would definitely be chocolate martinis. <laughs> nice. Yes. <laughs> well, you are you are correct. You you are a bastard who steals my answers, and uh, and and so I do have Giroud listed as my player because the worst looking model in his entourage would be just fine with me. Uh, <laughs> There's no issues there. I would drink champagne all night with with Olivier and his pat his his party posse, and uh, and where we'd go would be wherever no one would tell my beautiful wonderful wife because and you'd you know, have food poisoning the next day. 
I would have food poisoning the next week. <laughs> but uh, so I, I just want to give a shout out and a thank you to Dougie for destroying my family with this question, and uh, and, and it was a good one. So. Didn't you Question. text me last night that you were forcing your wife to listen to our podcast, which she thought was terrible? Uh, I don't think I said that she thought it was terrible, uh, <laughs> but yes, I did force her. To, you know, because after a few bottles of red wine, the podcast comes on. There's nothing more romantic when the kids are have sleepovers at someone else's here's, house. Here's than, exactly than making what your you wife wrote. Listen to your podcast. Here's exactly what you wrote. I Steph no and I are I drinking, and I'm forcing her to listen to our podcast. She's not a fan. <laughs> Well, you know, it's it's great when you when you've been married for twenty years, you have two wonderful children who neither of which were in the house at the time. Uh, you know, there's nothing more romantic to do than force your wife to listen to your podcast. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that's that was our Saturday night. Question number two from Chris uh, AF, at AFC Freddy Eight. Chris is uh, the host of one of the hosts of uh, Bear Camp Wonderland, which of course we're huge fans of. And he also hosts Football Hipster and about 39 other podcasts that he does per week. The man does nothing but watch football and host podcasts, apparently. Um, he asked a question that you're going to absolutely hate. Have you seen this question yet? Or, no, or I am I like, Okay. Chris and I have a little connection, which is that we are both uh, completely infantile fans of uh, mouth-breathing WWE wrestling fans. And, uh, and I've snuck in a few questions for him that were kind of – inside jokes for WWE and he's, he does the same in this podcast. So I know that you're, uh, you know, I blame my WWE uh, wrestling thing on my son, uh, which is unfair because most of the time he's not even around when I watch it, but read between the lines. So he asks in the current Arsenal squad, who is the universal champion, the intercontinental champion, the U S champion, the tag team champs and the women's champion and why? So, Mike, I, I couldn't even gonna, answer this question gonna, because I I'm haven't watched force... WWE since I was – arguably I lost my virginity. Um, yeah, yeah so, I'm not going to force you to answer this question, but I'm going to force you to listen to my answer. But, uh, but yeah, you, you are apparently way too mature to watch WWE. And, uh, you know, so good and, for you. Up at the... Yeah, I'm a better human being. Answer the question. <laughs> <laughs> All right. This is the part of the podcast where we appeal to 5% of our audience. All right. Tag team champs, Alexis and Mezit. Uh, either one of them could, 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 could be the main guy in the company, but they're so in sync right now. They have no problems putting the other one over. And, uh, and, and, and so they're, they're just the long time running tag team champs. Andy, the U.S. champ is, is a weird one because, you know, it used to be such an insignificant title belt to hold, oh, but now it's actually <laughs> – I'm, I'm losing the will to live. I'm trying, I'm trying to drive you crazy right now. But now it actually seems to matter. So normally it would go to someone who kind of needs a bit of a push, isn't necessarily a fan favorite, but, uh, that, but they want him to be. And so I'm going to give the U.S. title to Aaron Ramsey right now. Okay. All right, does that make sense? No, it doesn't. You and Chris <laughs> need to start a podcast called Virgins Are Us. I'm on the waiting list. I'm <laughs> <laughs> where you where, where you could like talk to other virgins about grown ass men jumping at each other. That's actually there's a waiting list right now. It's like the waiting list for for uh, for silver memberships at Arsenal. There's a waiting list to do a pod with Chris because he, he, all 168 hours of the week are filled right now with podcasts. But uh, but that's that's the next one to go. But all right, let me rush through this. Intercontinental champ, usually somebody who's come on the scene. He's very impressive, widely considered to be a future world champion or universal champion in the making. So uh, that's going to be Hector Bellerin. Um, the women's championship is a tough one because you know it, to be the women's champion, you're not supposed to have a penis, technically. Although some women's champions in the past, I think, have had penises, but I'll go with Olivier Giroud for obvious reasons. There, we've we've already been over those. And finally, at long last, this question is almost over. The universal champion is the big man on campus, the main man of the company. He's not necessarily the most flashy or the best player, but he's the one you can hitch your wagons to and be comfortable representing your team. Who do you think I'm thinking of for that? Any guesses, or are uh, you sleeping? At this point, Mike, I've like almost stabbed myself in the eye with a pen. <laughs> Lauren Koscielny is my Arsenal Football Club Universal Champion. So, 
Uh, thank you, Chris, and for destroying the rapport that Andy and I have <laughs> in this, built up over the last 19 weeks in this podcast. But you know, uh, to, to, to to point out, and and Chris probably Mike sent me a picture the other week of him watching hockey, eating a Wendy's Baconator, get your shit together, Wendy's, and watching WWE. A picture of me doing that, not a picture of Chris doing that. No, but I just want Chris to know that your oh, love okay. for WWE is on the same level as a Wendy's Baconator. Oh, and yeah, and that's that's saying something. And I've, we have sponsorships from neither of those two companies, unfortunately. Well, we're but, working. Wendy is just being a yeah. bitch. <laughs> Chris, also another fu- future host. We're going to get our act together and schedule something. So the next couple of months, uh, we'll, we'll have him on, and, and we'll, we're going to have to promise not to spend too much of it talking about wrestling. You know, the person with the editorial control, Mike, maybe this question (laughs) won't make its way onto the path. Oh, well, yeah, I can't wait to find out. Question number three from Ellis Mel, also uh, uh, another uh, Burkamp Wonderland guy who who looks like the love child of Cesc Fabregas and Riyad Mahrez, but he will kill you if you suggest that either one of his, you know, either one of those guys is his, is his doppelganger. Um, he asks, which two current Arsenal players would you sacrifice to the football gods to ensure the signatures of Alexis and Mezit? And, and he narrows it down to starting 11 and bench only. We can't use like, like Ainsley Maitland Niles and, um, uh, or any of those guys. So starting eleven and bench only. And oh, that's I'll a give really, it, I'll, that's a good question. I'll give, I'll give it to you first so that you can steal my fucking answers again. Oh man, if if I had to sacrifice one player, I think it would be uh, probably Gabriel because I feel like just based off of the look and form of his face, nothing <laughs> could destroy that man. So it'd be a lot like Superman dying. We'd all believe he was dead. And then after the the sacrifice was over, he would just pop back up, and all would be good again in the world. <laughs> so you think you can get away with sacrificing him, get the signatures, and then Gabriel comes back anyway? Yes, yes. Okay. All right. Well, that that's sneaky. I got to go with uh, well, yes, for two current players. So I'm going to go with Aaron Ramsey. Ooh, uh, Mike, I was going to say Aaron Ramsey. Yeah, I know you were, which is why I slid it in there really quickly. <laughs> but I didn't ask you for your second player. Wait, you slid I... it in quickly, or you don't? You don't. <laughs> <laughs> you don't put some slow music on first and get the, I, get as the I've said going. many as I've said in many f- previous podcasts, I think we just named this podcast. Yep. Mike slides it in quickly. <laughs> <laughs> uh since you love putting my name in the title of the podcast, so I won't fight it this week. I gotta go with Aaron Ramsey. Uh you know, sorry, but uh if if we have to pick somebody to How to, dare to, you, Mike, he's Welsh. To get the signatures of Alexis and Ozil, I'll, I'll go with Ramsey. And my second, I don't know if, if he counts as starting 11 and bench only anymore, but Per Mertesacker. Oh, my God. I'm I sad to go with Per as well. <laughs> I, I'm sad to say i got to go with Per. And if Per's not allowable, then I'll go with Gabrielle. That was that was my, my next choice. But uh, but Per Mertesacker, you, it, we just I, – I, I love the man. Uh, I, and, and clearly he's still a good influence even though he's he's, you know – He's not physically able to play anymore, uh, and hasn't been for the last few years. But um, you know, it's you got to put him out of his misery if it means that we'll get those two. So, excellent questions. Thank you, boys, for yes, uh, for sending them in. Appreciate it. What do we got coming up this week? Uh, not much. <laughs> two games. <laughs> I wasn't talking about your personal life. I'm talking, this is an Arsenal podcast, you oh. know. Oh, excuse me, Mike. Mr. <laughs> fucking, let's talk about WWE for fucking 45 minutes. Okay, all right. So, Everton on Tuesday. Any yeah. question that we're, I mean, that we're not going to beat them? No. Uh, current form, looking at the way they're playing, we're going to, we should, we should walk them, Mike. Let's be honest with each other. Come on, man. We should, and and um, you know, just between you, me, and the you know the, the one hundred and forty thousand people that listen, uh, we're gonna we're gonna kill them. Uh, there, I mean, I've never been more confident about a game than Everton, which of course means that you know some crazy shit's gonna happen, and and all of a sudden it'll be negative Arsenal uh, Twitter all over again. But uh, I mean, this team Everton's in shambles right now, and we're in whatever the opposite of shambles are. Yeah, yeah, we are on a great run. They are on a terrible run. We should just I, – I would – you know, we're probably going to do this in predictions, but I'm going to say 3-0. 3-0. Uh, 
Three nil. Well, okay, we're doing. Yeah, I, I think we're going to win by more than that. But I'll get I'll get to that in predictions. And then Man City. Um, this for me is tricky. I feel like the only way that we don't win this match is if we're not mentally prepared for it. And that's, I think, the one downside to this team right now. And we haven't really been in a situation outside of United where we've shown our lack of mental toughness. And so I hope that doesn't find its way into the City city game, but I guess we'll see. I mean, we're, we're going to know by Sunday afternoon next week whether we're in this for the title or not. Yeah. I mean, it, this week, uh, a team we should spank and a team we should – and a, and a Big team that we should beat, uh, especially given their their uh, their their suspensions and such. Uh, I mean, if if we don't get six points, then maybe we're kind of not quite there yet. But I I, I I I can see us getting six points. I think it's it's the week to just to, to prove to everybody that we're we're in this for the long run. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree. Let's see what happens. Let's go on to picks, Mike. Pick Pickums. Yep. Pickums, we got pick, ten. Pick, pick, pick There's two match days between now and our next podcast, so we're not we're not going to bore everybody with uh, with. T- I mean, uh, as much as you may want, you're tweeting me, you're asking for more picks, more picks, Mike. That everyone just constantly saying, but we're just going to do the Tuesday and Wednesday matches uh, this time. And our guest picker for this week, uh, well, first of all, guest picker last week. Uh, who was our guest picker last? Oh, it was um, Mr. Eric Howland. It was Eric Howland, and uh, and he did a good job. He actually uh, going into this morning's game, he he got two right. I got zero right, so I'm back on form. Uh, and you got one, so it's it's 34 for Andy, 30 for the guest spot, and 27 for me uh, going into this week. This week's guest picker is Rob Ford, who is. Rob is one of my true Arsenal brothers. Uh, I've met him at the pub a few years ago. Uh, he has literally become uh, just a, practically a brother to me um, and um, just goes to show you what the, what the Arsenal family is all about. He's, but, uh, uh, he's a great human being. He is, and, uh, and a future guest on the pod as well. Yep. So we're, we're, we're pretty much set for the next year on guests. We just have to figure out when they're coming in, but... All right, Arsenal at Everton. You've already given a, a, a prediction. Three 0 Three 0 I'm going six <laughs> one. This is this is one of those games where we're just scoring goal, goals for sport. Um, Coquelin, I, I, I say this every week because ultimately at some point I will be right. Coquelin's going to break his Arsenal duck. Nice. He's going to break that shit all over uh, Goodison Everton's Park. So face. exactly, <laughs> just break it all over their face. And Rob says Arsenal two Everton one. Um, Arsene Wenger has a zipper malfunction that they actually show on TV this week. I did read, I, I did hear on the radio something about how he went back in the locker room and had his jacket zipped up. <laughs> I, I completely, you know, I, I'm not sure whether there was anything about that on the television, but but uh, they they did mention that on the radio. So, all right, so we were all pretty confident about Arsenal at Everton. Liverpool at Borough. Andy. Oh, uh, on Liverpool's form, I'm going to go 2-1 two, two, Liverpool. Okay, 2-1 Liverpool. And by the way, I think I did predict something like 6 nothing or 6-1 Liverpool in this game that's going on right now against West Ham because West Ham is such shit, but, uh, and, and they're well on their way already. Uh-huh. Uh, I'm going to call the Liverpool Borough game a 1-1 tie. Uh, with Callum Chambers single-handedly dispossessing the Brazilian samurai uh, for Mina every time he prepares to put a shot on goal. So I'm, I'm hoping Liverpool drops some points there. And Rob says Liverpool 3, Burrow 1, Klopp lands wrong while celebrating and misses three days. Three days <laughs> Three days of what? I have no idea, but, but he, he's out for three days. Um, Hull at Tottenham. Hull at Tottenham. Uh, I'm going to have to go with Scum 2, Tottenham 0. 2-0. All right, yeah. Um, I got 3-0 because Hull are just complete shit. I mean, they they don't look like they're staying up at this point. Um, and Rob also has 2-0, Dos Acero, uh, Tottenham over Hull. One of the goals will be an ill-gotten penalty kick that Kane will score on. I mean, all of his goals are from ill-gotten penalty kicks, mm-hmm. I think. So, um, Man United at Crystal Palace, my favorite 
favorite non-Arsenal team, Crystal Palace? Oh, this is a this is going to be a tough one because both teams are just absolutely shit. But I'm going to go with Palace upset one nil Palace. Ooh, nice. Okay. I also have well, no, uh, yeah, I do have an upset. I have two one Palace, but I give a little bit more detail than you because Jason Punchin, my favorite <laughs> player in the world takes multiple shits on Jose Mourinho's stupid face, and it distracts his team so that they fall to a 2-1 defeat. Although, in retrospect, I think that that would actually inspire his team more than it would distract them. But, yeah, you're, yeah, you're right. But, um, yeah, Jose was, would officially be a shithead in that situation. But, yeah, um, and Rob, sorry, Rob has them, uh, Man United, winning this game. Shocker, 3-1. Three three to one. Jose, and he spells it with an H and a, and the and the accent over the <laughs> and an accent over the E, so he's he's anatomically correct. Um, Jose will be relegated to the touchline for the third consecutive match. Which, depending on whether what I saw before was actually, I'm going to check this when we get off the pod. But uh, if he was actually relegated to the touchline, that was amazing foresight from Rob, um, where he will yell at the water boy for having the bottle so close to his feet. <laughs> Rob says. <laughs> And finally, Burnley at West Ham. Oh, that's our sh- that's our shit game of the week. Ah, uh, I'm gonna go nil nil, as you often do for our shit game of the week. <laughs> um, two nil Burnley. West Ham is going down. I mean, I, I don't know how you're expecting um, what's his name, Winston Reed, to 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 pitch a shutout in this game, but uh, two nil to Burnley, and. Rob has it 1-1, one, one, uh, Burnley at West Ham. West Ham continues their slow, dreadful march towards relegation. So we also have picks uh, for the for the weekend games, but uh, but we'll we'll talk about how those turned out after the fact, and that way we can I can make myself look much better. So <laughs> so yeah, that's picks for the week. Cool. Any final thoughts? Uh, before we wrap this up, you know, I think we need to, you know, I feel like one of the, the biggest non game topics is the Ozil Sanchez contract situation. And definitely, and I just want to say that, you know, if, if Sanchez doesn't sign a contract, Carl Jenkinson is ready to play center forward. Um, <laughs> part of me, yeah. you know, there's, there's people on Twitter that are apparently in the know and, and, and all that bullshit and what have you. And it seems like, if you read between the lines, contract negotiations are ongoing, and there's variables that we clearly don't know about. I often wonder, Mike, with with Arson being Arson, and he's that economical guy. Does he see this this whole thing of if I pay these guys and sign them to a contract in December, when I could do it in March or April, that's two hundred fifty thousand pounds a week times two times however many weeks. So does he see the the savings of saying if I delay this? Um, I think the it's ballsy if that's actually what he would be doing because you know you could go on a terrible run, be fifteen points behind Chelsea and and for sure not win another title where both players say hey I want to leave, but. Could that be playing into his economical mindset of I'm just going to hold out? But, you know, it, I feel like it maybe. would be a massive boost of confidence if we could at least sign one of the two here around the holiday period, if not early into next year. I, I, I think that would be great. And and believe me, I want these two guys signed. I, the numbers that are being thrown around are, are, are ridiculous. You can't – I mean, it's it's worse than transfer season silly stuff. I mean, the, the 384,000 pounds and – and I mean, all, all these different things. Are, I, I just don't believe any of it, but it, it worries me. But by the same token, and, and, I, and I'm guilty of it because I, I keep tweeting every time that Alexis scores, I keep tweeting, you know, his salary is now 300,000, pay him and, and sign him. But the reality is, how fucked are we as Arsenal supporters in general for, for like taking what is the best run that we've had in 10 years, maybe, and and just and spoiling it basically by by being so freaked out by these contracts. I mean, let's enjoy it. The, the two of those guys look so happy right now. They look like they're loving the football they're playing. They look like they're loving each other. I mean, the, Alexis putting his fingers through Ozil's hair or uh, after the goal he scored yesterday was just so romantic. Um, you know, it, it, they're enjoying life right now. So whatever it is going on right now, 
keep it going. Don't worry about the contracts. Uh, you know, and, and I'm like fighting my own better judgment by saying that, but I think we just need to stop already and just let it happen. Cause, cause they're, they're playing, uh, wor- they're, they're worldies right now and whatever is motivating them or not motivating them, it's working. It's pointing in the right direction. Speaking of worldies, Payette just scored an incredible free Ooh. kick. It's 1-1. No, I agree with you, Mike. And I, and I know, the, you know, the reason that Arsenal fans, everyone knows this. I mean, we've always had contract issues. We've always had players leaving in the past. And let's be honest, Arson needs to break the wage structure to keep these two players. And at the end of the day, I think that with the world of football evolving, with the money that's in there, for us to get players of that caliber, we're going to have to be paying in the 200 plus thousand a week. Um, and, and let's be uh, even cavalier about it, Mike. These are two players that deserve that type of money. Yeah, oh, I think so. I think so. There's a lot. There's a lot to it that you have to think about, and 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 I can't claim to know all of the different elements uh, to it, but uh, I I do think we need to sign them. Um, it just not not gonna I'm not gonna force myself to, to to be physically ill over it at this point in time. Right. Uh, there've got there've got to be other superstar players who are valuable to their teams who have 18 months left on their contracts, and you're just not hearing people just agitating and and getting ill over the fact that they're that they're not. You well, know, that's because it. it's Arsenal, and that's what we do as fans. Exactly, and that brings me back to my original point, which is how fucked are we for for ruining this 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 run that we're on by worrying about these two and what'll happen after they're gone. So, yeah. and and uh, going to kind of round off by, by telling you a little story. In my evening last week out, we ran into uh, one of Jake's uh, old soccer coaches and um, and his family, and they they're as Manchester United as he gets around these parts. I mean, they they are legit. They're they're from Hungary. And they go back to Hungary every year to visit family, and they also make a stop in Manchester, go to the games, which is you know more than most Manchester United fans in London uh, do, because that's where all the fans are from. <laughs> but um, when he saw me, he literally pulled me close to him, like by the shirt, and said, because I was wearing an Arsenal-related shirt, because I have no clothes that aren't, and he said, don't be like all these other Arsenal fans I keep talking to who keep talking about, you know, Wenger should have done this, Wenger should have done that. It's time to move on. He says, it's never time to move on when you have someone like Wenger. He said, take it from me. Go on. You're going to miss him. And in that, and I've known from like, I mean, you could see that he was suffering right now and that he's just so fed up with his team. But, um, you know, it, it wise words. And, and I've had yeah. a very different opinion quite often in recent years. I mean, it, it, I've, I've, I've thought that it was time and I've supported people who have an even angrier sentiment in, in their right to be able to express it. But, you know, the reality is he keeps proving me wrong. And you know, all you have to do is look at what's happening at United right now. they are three coaches down, uh, from, from Ferguson and they're just, worse and worse off every year. So it's it's hard to have a, a different opinion and not really take the validity in his sentiments to me. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. We need to enjoy what we've got in front of us at this moment, and the grass isn't always greener. But with that being said, United knew they were selling their soul to the devil when they brought Jose Mourinho, and so <laughs> they can all fuck off if they want to whine over that because they knew exactly what they were getting. Yeah, I um, almost felt bad for him, but but yeah, uh, no. Any, I, just, I, any, any, I decided to focus on his message rather than 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 rub his head in it absolutely. because you know because I do have a kind kind soul at times. And uh, he was suffering enough. So, Mike, tell us about next week's uh, guest. Yeah, Adam Hoffman uh, is coming on. He, he he helped us with some guest picks, which seems to kind of be the the, the launching pad to becoming a, a guest on this pod. But I'm really looking forward to it. Adam recently came home from uh, from a deployment in the Middle East. Uh, he is a, a true hero uh, for fighting for our country and and um, and one that that you know. We want to find out a little bit more about how he spread his arsenaldom uh, abroad, and 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 how you know rooting for for a soccer team mixes in with with a, a actual pursuit that is important enough, uh, like like fighting for your country. And 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 I know he's mentioned a few ways in which uh, you know while he was gone, people 
uh, kind of keeping him involved uh, with the Arsenal. But I'm looking forward to it. He's a great guy. Looking forward to getting to know him a little bit better and uh, for kind of going over what should hopefully be two happy reviews of Everton and Man City with him next week. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Mike, it's been a great pod. We've covered a lot. Uh, for those who have listened, thank you so much. For those new listeners, uh, please listen again. And uh, review us on iTunes if you can. Take a minute out of your day. It would mean a lot to Mike. Um, <laughs> he's hit rock bottom, obviously. We've all seen this from his, his love of WWE. And yes. so uh, he needs that boost. And so if we could provide that boost for him, that would be absolutely great. Thank you. This is a charitable effort after all. So please be charitable to me uh, and give us give us a little cuddle on, uh, on on iTunes. So thank you very much. Great great job, Andy. And uh, poor job for me. And uh, come on, you Gooners. Join in the banter through our social media outlets. You can like us on Facebook at Gooners in USA. Follow us on Twitter at, at Gooners in USA. Send us an email at Gooners at Gooners in USA dot com. Check out our website, which is www.goonersinusa.com. You can subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, and please send us questions, comments, suggestions, or anything you'd like addressed on the pod. Come on, you Gooners.